This is the Monday, September 14th, 2015 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and you're listening to The History Author Show on iHeartRadio. From Thomas Edison to Dr. Egon Spengler in Ghostbusters, the image of the quirky, driven scientist working in solitude, wearing crumpled clothes, and having unkempt hair is a really popular one in the American imagination. But today, you need big machines to make big scientific discoveries, particle accelerators, electron microscopes, and supercomputers that advance human knowledge. We're talking Skynet here, people, something really big and really smart. You can't fit that in your basement. So how did we get from Alexander Graham Bell in his lonely laboratory to Robert Oppenheimer assembling and leading a massive team to beat Hitler's Nazis to the atom bomb, or the U.S. racing the Soviets to the moon? Today's book introduces us to the man behind this revolution, one that touches all aspects of our modern life. It's called Big Science, Ernest Lawrence and the Invention that Launched the Military-Industrial Complex. The author is Pulitzer Prize winner Michael Hiltzik. He's a graduate of Colgate and of the Graduate School of Journalism at our own Columbia University right here in Manhattan. He's also written previous books on the Hoover Dam's construction and the New Deal. You can follow him on Twitter at HiltzikM and visit his website, michaelhiltzik.com. Now here's our conversation. Come along as we enter the laboratory of big science all around us. I'm joined on the line by Michael Hiltzik, author of Big Science, Ernest Lawrence and the Invention that Launched the Military-Industrial Complex. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show today, sir. It's my pleasure to be here. I earned a degree in animal science from Rutgers University, and the science part was never a sexy answer to what's your major. Scientists just really aren't cast as heroes in this story of human advancement the way they used to be, say, during the space race or the early days of the Industrial Revolution. But you gave us that sort of adventure in big science, and so I wanted to start off by asking, how did you get drawn to Ernest Lawrence and capture him as a hero of modern enlightenment? That's a very good question. I think anyone who studies the history of science, specifically the history of physics in the last part of the 20th century, comes into contact with the name of Ernest Lawrence over and over again because of his role in creating this new paradigm that we call big science. Capital intensive, big team science using big machines and lots of equipment to delve into the secrets of the natural world. So I got very interested in that aspect of his career. And of course, he did all of his work in Berkeley, which is here in California where I am. And he really put Berkeley on the map as a center of higher energy physics and and advanced scientific research. And once I realized all that, I wanted to learn more. And with every book I've ever written, these, these all start when I get curious about a subject and can't find enough written to satisfy my curiosity. So I get inspired to do the research myself, and that's really how this book came about. I wanted to mention the cover, and I talked about this in our pilot episode. I said, when you look at it, it almost looks like a Rockwell painting, and it's an exciting moment because he's looking there into the machine, and I wanted to ask you to just describe this sort of moment of discovery. Yes, you know, I had the exact same reaction to the cover when the, when the art was first shown to me. It did look like a Norman Rockwell painting to me, too, and that was really appropriate because Ernest Lawrence was such a quintessential American of his time, a Midwestern America. He was born to a family of Norwegian-American immigrants. He was educated at three public universities for most of his education. And what he's doing there on the cover of my book is that he's, he's peering into one of his very first cyclotrons with one of his associates. 
And this was at the stage when he was still trying to learn how to build the machine much better and really refine it. And it really was the start of his, of his career. It wasn't the very beginning, of course, because his first cyclotrons were so small they could fit in the palm of his hand, but, but they were really prototypes. This machine that he's looking at was the first truly operating cyclotron. It, was, it had a 37-inch magnet. It really was the first one that was sort of a professional scale machine. And he built that first one that you said fit in his hand for a hundred bucks. That seems awful low. I never priced one. That seems low. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't so low for what he was building at the time. This was the very first cyclotron that he developed, that very first prototype that, as I described it in the book, looked sort of like a flask that had been run over by a truck. And of course, if you follow through the many generations, the many iterations of the cyclotron that have followed over the next 80 years, the latest one and the biggest one is the Large Hadron Collider, which is built on the border of France and Switzerland by the European consortium CERN, and that occupies a tunnel 17 miles in circumference and costs $9 billion to build. So you can get a sense of the transition of the evolution of this machine from a $100 unit that fit in the palm of Lawrence's hand to a $9 billion machine that has to be buried in a tunnel underground. Explain in layman's terms what a cyclotron is and what the real-world applications are for it. The cyclotron is, at its core, a very effective and very efficient atom smasher. Lawrence designed his first cyclotrons as an answer to the call for a machine that could create high energies to propel particles into the atomic nucleus to help physicists examine what was going on inside those nuclei. And what he did essentially was he took a linear accelerator, one that might require a mile of length to get a particle up to the needed energies. Sort of a circle like those old toys you'd play on the playground when you were a kid yes. and every time it would pass by your right. dad or your big brother, whoever would hit it every time and speed it up a little bit. Right. That's how I envision it anyway. Right. Lawrence took the concept of a linear accelerator, which would require as much as a mile in length to get a particle up to the needed energy, and he bent it into a circle, and he did this by applying a magnetic field to the path of the particle he was using to bombard the nucleus. And that basically allowed him to add energies to these particles over and over again using a single electrode. So it was very compact. It was very efficient because it created a lot of energy in a very short time. And as I said, it was very effective, the most effective atom smasher that anybody had seen up to that point. And it had practical applications. I imagine some people are thinking, well, why would you want to smash an atom? Well, you can see so much about it. It's like anything, I guess. If you saw a computer for the first time and you wanted to know what was in it, first thing you would do would be to take it apart. And he had that natural curiosity, which was sort of captured in that cover photo of the book, you could see there's somebody intensely looking. All that matters to him at that moment is just seeing something that maybe nobody's ever seen before through that window. That's right. And I like that about him. The essential principle is that if you are examining something, what you need are tools and probes that are smaller and more precise than your target. For example, if you want to find out what makes a fire truck tick, you don't attack it with a bulldozer. You attack it with a screwdriver. By the same token, if you want to figure out what's going on inside the atomic nucleus, and this was really something that physicists were very, very curious about starting in the early 1930s or even earlier, you need a beam, a particle beam that's much smaller and much more precise than the nucleus itself. And that's what the cyclotron really accomplished. It enabled physicists to create high-energy bullets, essentially, high-energy probes to penetrate the atomic nucleus with a precision that nobody had been able to achieve before. And I like that the book, Big Science, it covers him as a human being. It's not about the numbers and about the physics. And obviously there's that in there because that was those are the tools that he used or his mind and his scientific training. But he wasn't the stereotypical brooding egghead that I think people picture when they hear the word science and somebody who made a big discovery and is really a legend in his field. And you write, for instance, that the most he'd say when he was upset was, oh, sugar. He's not stomping around. He's not really getting upset. He's just aiming at what he wants. And he was kind of seemed kind of even keel in those moments. And so I wanted to ask you to sort of strip off his lab smock for the listeners and tell them about the man they'll get to know in big science, the man behind the big machines. 
Well, Lawrence had the perfect personality for an America that was really looking to climb out from the shadow of the European scientific tradition. You know, the, the, the general image of the scientists for the American public at that time was the mad scientist, wild hair, sort of Einsteinian, working by himself be in a gothic laboratory behind uh, closed doors, a little bit strange, a little bit foreign, uh, and, and very absent-minded. Well, Lawrence was the opposite of all that. He was very down-to-earth. He was as American as apple pie. He could explain what he was doing in terms that the general public could understand very, very easily. He had this sort of uh, American approach to it, very unassuming, very kind, very, very precise and, and effective at managing people around him. And I think that's what helped make him become the most famous American-born scientist in the country at the time. And you have a bunch of photographs in the book, too, that I wanted to mention, because as I was reading the book, of course, every now and then you sort of decide you're going to flip to the photos when you hit a part of the story where it mentions one of the people you've seen a picture of. And I started to come to think of it as the scientists at play section, just because here they are with their machines and they're, you know, they're in cars, they're sort of standing around sometimes doing things. And it's just how it sort of struck me that it really brought them alive. And I wanted you to describe Ernest Lawrence's relationships with his peers, like Robert Oppenheimer, I guess, is the name that most people would be familiar with. What was it like to work with him? Well, the relationship between Ernest Lawrence and Robert Oppenheimer really is, in many ways, the, the spine of my book. And, and it's important because that relationship really helped define American science, especially American physics from the 1930s right through into the 1960s. Lawrence and Oppenheimer were about the same age. They came to Berkeley at about the same time, and in their, their early years there, they were very, very close personal friends. In fact, Lawrence's first son, Robert, was named after Robert Oppenheimer. Hmm. And they also had a, a complementary approach to physics. Oppenheimer was the quintessential and brilliant theorist who was pretty hopeless when he was around machinery. Lawrence's grasp of theory was sometimes not as firm as, as it should have been, but he was an inspired experimentalist. He was just a genius with machinery. And they would work together. Lawrence would discover some sort of effect or some result from the cyclotron, and he would take it to Oppenheimer, who would explain what was going on sort of underneath the hood. And this was really key to helping bring American physics ahead. Working together, they turned Berkeley from a physics backwater into the leading research university in America, which I think it still reigns as. And it's amazing, just to go back for one second, you said about the 30s to the 60s. If people just stop for a moment to think of what that period meant to not just science, but big science, you start in the 30s, uh, as you said, with maybe somebody sort of the tinkering in the lab, the small scientist, maybe a little solitary, the stereotype we think of, like in that there's that great Twilight Zone episode that Buster Keaton is in where the guy invents a time machine helmet in his basement. But that's sort of the 30s. And then you think of the 60s. We're already talking the space race. We're putting human beings in space. It's a huge period. And their fingerprints are really on that. And it's it's an exciting story of this quest for knowledge that they both had. Right. And the two of them working together really did define physics, American physics, even British physics in that age. And of course, one of the intervening events was World War II, and they worked together to develop the atomic bomb, which was, as I write, the project that really validated the whole approach of big science. You could not build an atomic bomb as a solitary researcher working in your lab by yourself. You needed a lot of equipment. You needed millions or billions of dollars, and you needed big teams to put it all together. That's really what developed the atomic bomb, and it was Lawrence and Oppenheimer working together that really brought that about. And that brings us to the subhead of the book, the military-industrial complex. When I saw that subtitle, The Big Science, of course, as anyone would, you think of Eisenhower's farewell address, which invokes it. And it made me think that Ike originally wanted to say military-industrial congressional complex. Sort of left that out because he still hoped to get something out of Congress and he didn't want to tick them off. But I wanted to ask you how our current system, where we have lobbyists, we have people who professionally go and they lobby for grants or for earmarks or whatever it is they want. How do you think that compares to Ernest Lawrence's day where he could really come and bring some gravitas to it? He could talk with knowledge and make sure that we were pursuing not just big science, but good science like radar. And you mentioned, of course, the atomic bomb. 
Well, Lawrence had the authority uh, d- during his life to really, really manage the relationship between the military and industry and government and academia, where he was. And I, I don't think we have anybody quite like him anymore. And of course, the world has changed. The military industrial complex has become much more powerful. Industry plays a much bigger role in scientific research than it did even during Lawrence's time. And of course, it was Lawrence who really presided over science at a time when industry was, was becoming a much bigger factor in funding research. So, so I, I think the world that Eisenhower was, was wary of and warned about really has in many ways come to pass. We, we can read Eisenhower's speech about the military-industrial complex and recognize a lot of what governed scientific research and government behavior and industrial research in today's day and age. And, and I, I think that's a little disquieting, and I think it would have disturbed Ernest Lawrence because he really did want to make sure that, that the military and academia and government and industry all work together for the goals that he thought were important, which really were focused on basic research. He seems like the kind of guy, too, who got along with people towards that goal. And there's another book that I was reading recently, Madison's Gift, and it talks about the five relationships that he had with founding fathers, Jefferson, etc., and how he really would find people that had a gift, perhaps, that he didn't, and he would try to bring them over to his cause. And when I was reading about Ernest Lawrence, I thought of how you're in L.A., you're calling from L.A. today, and the films usually show the military and scientists in this perpetual conflict. David Marcus in The Wrath of Khan tells his mother, scientists have always been pawns of the military. And one of the most fascinating parts of big science was reading about Lawrence's personal relationships with these generals from World War II, because you might not immediately think that they would have had this good working relationship, but he had a relationship with them, didn't he? Yes, he did. And, you know, there always was a tension between the military and the scientists, especially during the Second World War, and especially within the Atomic Bomb Project, the Manhattan Project. Lawrence did have a a really unique skill at bringing these camps together and making sure that they all work together with a shared goal. And the goal, of course, was to build this weapon that everybody thought was necessary to build because they were afraid that Nazi Germany would get to it first. And that was possible. Lawrence knew how to cultivate his military counterparts, and he knew how to make sure that they got what they wanted without really compromising his own goals. And that was very important. And I think that's a skill that's very rare and is especially rare today. We're speaking with author Michael Hiltzik, and the book is Big Science, Ernest Lawrence and the Invention that Launched the Military-Industrial Complex. You can find today's guest on Twitter at HiltzikM or at MichaelHiltzik.com. And speaking of Twitter, in that romantic basement lab, we were talking about the things that sort of started off with Lawrence. He worked out the first color TV design or what would become the first color TV design, the gun with that big back to <laughs> that we used to have before we have flat screens today. And that gave rise to the early computer screens. While reading Big Science, I started noticing a lot of these digital children of his legacy, so to speak. And I wanted to ask if you started noticing those everywhere. Well, I think what we see around us every day are, are the uh, is the paradigm of big science. So much that we've accomplished in science over the last 20, 30, 40 years really is the result of, of this method of doing science that Lawrence pioneered. Big science is all around us. When you walk on a, on a university campus and you pass by the buildings with physics labs and molecular biology labs, that's big science. When you think about the effort to put a man on the moon and send research satellites into the farthest reaches of our solar system, that's big science. The Human Genome Project, a $3 billion effort that created a new science and a new industry, that was big science. And we will need big science to address these huge problems that confront us, including climate change, that can't be solved by small science. It can only be solved by big science. And it costs hundreds of millions of dollars billions of dollars to accomplish. That's what we have to do. And and we have to know how to manage these sorts of projects. And it was Ernest Lawrence who really showed the way. 
And you mentioned before, to pick up off that, the Large Hadron Collider. And I started to think of the political side of it and trying to get the money for a scientific endeavor, something really you can't even see, right? We're talking particles. How would someone like Lawrence argue for American investment in something that's going to be built over in Europe when our elected leaders, they prefer things like train lines and (laughs) things that they can have a big ribbon cutting ceremony, maybe brag about American jobs. How do you think he would have gone about lobbying for that himself? Well, you know, in a way, Lawrence was fortunate in that some of the real questions that have been raised for us by the the sheer cost of big science were not that germane while he was still alive. And he died in 1958, even though they were beginning to emerge. Big science becomes so expensive that the money it takes comes into conflict with all the other needs that we may want to, as a society, spend money on, whether it's ending hunger or ending poverty or even finding drugs and getting drugs to sufferers of diseases who need them. The reason that the Large Hadron Collider is the largest atom smasher in the world is because the United States abandoned its own big science project in the same field. That was a superconducting super collider that was going to go into a tunnel in Texas and was canceled by Congress in 1993 because it was so expensive. And that's after it had already cost $2 billion. So the question of how much do we want to spend on big science and how do we justify it is something that's really very important for scientists today. One of the reasons that the superconducting supercollider was canceled is that American physicists couldn't get together and present a single voice to support it. They could not articulate what we would learn from it and how important it was for science in a way that everybody in Congress understood. I think that's the real challenge for scientists today when when what they want to do requires so much money. And it's something that Lawrence really was a master of. He knew how to communicate the goals of science and how important these were going to be and how much they would help the average man on the street in a way that that scientists today aren't as good at and, and may not be good at all at. And I think what we really need is to see somebody emerge who's got those skills, who really can stand up for science and big science in the way that he did. It's interesting. I wonder if maybe because of the idea of people working together, that's sort of the fruit of his labors. Sometimes people are in a lab, even if but they're in a big group and they may not have those personal skills. You People are very specialized today in science and they may not have to go to a dinner party and discuss with somebody, well, this is what I'm working on today and this is why it's important. And he had that excitement in him where he wanted to share it with you like a good writer, like yourself, and to go there and say, hey, this is why this matters. This is why it's important. That's right. Lawrence had a unique personality and and a unique skill at communicating his goals and what he needed to achieve them and getting those resources. He was the man who created the teams that helped him achieve those goals. It's much harder for scientists today who come up through teamwork. The teams that discovered the Higgs boson through the Large Hadron Collider in 2012, these were teams of 3,000 scientists. So, of course, it's hard for any one of them to emerge as a spokesman and certainly a unique personality. And I I think that really does tell you what the challenge is for science today to communicate its goals in a way that gets the resources that it needs. And I think of the book Flowers for Algernon, of all books, because when Charlie, the main character, becomes very smart with with this experimental drug, He tries to talk to people and he realizes how each person is so specialized and he's so beyond them by this point that there's really no one person that knows everything. As you said, the atom bomb was not going to be a solitary job. And before I picked up big science, I'd forgotten that FDR was on the verge of canceling the Manhattan Project, the race for the bomb. And I didn't know that Ernest Lawrence saved it. Talk about a real world application for big science. To go briefly over sort of the history of the making of the atomic bomb, the effort really started in 1939 when Albert Einstein signed his letter to FDR in which he communicated the fact that the new discoveries in nuclear fission implied that a bomb could be built using the the energies within the atomic nucleus and warning that Nazi Germany could get to the bomb first if the Allies did not move faster. Well, after Einstein's letter got to FDR, the U.S. government sort of swung into action, created a uranium committee to start work on a problem. 
But that bogged down very quickly. It bogged down in bureaucracy. It bogged down in inertia. And by 1940, the men who were in charge of husbanding America's scientific brain power and resources for the coming war were on the verge of canceling it because American physicists hadn't made the case that a bomb could be developed in time to affect the war or in, in time to really play a role in winning the war. And their concerns about that project were well placed because obviously for every dime that you spent on a project that wasn't going to have anything to do with ending the war was a dime that you had to divert from a project that maybe could have an effect on the war. Well, Lawrence learned about these doubts, and he demanded a face-to-face -face meeting with these people, Vannevar Bush of the Carnegie Institute and James Conant of Harvard, and he made it very clear to them that not only was a bomb feasible, and feasible in the near term, but that the, the work was urgent. He told them that physicists who had come over from Europe were convinced that the physicists who stayed behind in the Third Reich were perfectly capable of developing this bomb themselves, and that if that was so, if Hitler got it first, then civilization really hung in the balance. And he persuaded Conant, and he persuaded Bush. And the, the key came when Conant said to him, Ernest, I keep hearing this from physicists like yourself, but nobody seems to be willing to put aside all their other work and devote the next years of their lives to developing this bomb for us. Will you do it? And Lawrence thought for a, really just for a split second, and he said, if you tell me you need me to do that job, I will do it. And that was the first time that Conan had heard a, a physicist of Lawrence's stature not only communicate that the bomb was feasible and necessary, but that he would take on the job of actually developing it. After that moment, and that came in September of 1941, the Manhattan Project was never again in doubt. And over the next four years, Lawrence played an incredibly important role in that project. He supervised a lot of the experimental work. He brought Oppenheimer, his close friend and colleague, into the Manhattan Project. And then, of course, Oppenheimer played also a very important role. Really, it was Lawrence who made sure that this project came to fruition. It's an incredible moment. And I, I love the book about somebody who doesn't really get their due. And in Big Science, there's a line where he says, I'm going to be famous, after, sort of, I guess, a little bit jokingly, but <laughs> he should be famous or at least respected. Other than reading Big Science, how can we carry on his legacy of pushing forward the frontiers of human knowledge. Well, one thing I think we can always be sure of is that, that humankind's thirst for knowledge about the, about the world we live in, about the universe we live in, is really unquenchable. And I think you can tell that just by contemplating the reaction to the photographs that we're just getting from Pluto. It thrills even laypersons with their precision and teaches us so much more that we didn't know about how planets are formed and about their life cycle. So I think we really need to have confidence in the fact that our curiosity is always going to be there. And then the question is, well, how do we make sure that we get the resources to address that curiosity? And that really requires strong advocacy for science, strong advocacy for education and nature, and particularly it requires strong advocacy for government funding of basic science, because industry is never going to fund basic science. It's really always going to be interested in research that can advance its own commercial goals. And that's natural, but it's government that we rely on to be the patron of basic science. It's science that we engage in without really knowing where it's going to lead. But this is the seed corn of everything else that we learn about our world, of everything else that we learn that we invent for our own good. So we really need to nurture that level of science. And that's something that Lawrence always was involved in. It was something that he always believed in very, very strongly and always advocated. And he was famous. He was the most famous American-born scientist of his generation. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was always being quoted in the newspapers and speaking to radio audiences and then eventually even TV audiences. So he was really a, an unbelievably effective advocate 
for this sort of science, and we need to find the people who can communicate the same urgency and the same need and the same curiosity that he did. Michael Hiltzik, I don't think I could say it any better than that. I was trying to think of a reason I would tell someone to pick up big science and put it in their hands, and that's it. We need people who are not just going to be great math minds, but also people that are going to be able to really communicate it. And if you want to do that, well, your country needs you, human beings need you, and I think that that's a great note to leave it on. So pick up Big Science. Thank you for writing Big Science and giving Ernest Lawrence a little bit of what he's owed for giving humankind so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. Again, the book is Big Science, Ernest Lawrence and the Invention that Launched the Military-Industrial Complex. As always, you can find the link to purchase the book at our website, historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. We have our eye on this gently used super collider, and we get a dime or so every time you click through to buy a book on our site. Thanks again to Michael Hiltzik for joining me and for shining light on a man that we should all remember a little bit better because he gave us so much. You'll find Michael at HiltzikM on Twitter or at MichaelHiltzik.com. And remember, Tweet us what you think of the book at History Dean or comment at facebook.com slash history author. Well, that's it for this week's installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us next week for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please leave a review. So until next Monday morning when we upload that new episode, thanks so much for listening and happy reading.